Right. Guess what? Oh, okay. Jumping right in. What? I looked it up last night and Christina Parcell worked at the vet we took Onyx to. No. no I swear way. to God. I swear to God. Shut the hell up. If y'all don't know, Onyx is my dog. I'm sure you all know by now. Foothills Vet. Don't say the name. It's I Googled it. You can Google it. They they like put out statements when she was murdered and they're like, she was a, such a good worker, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I know. I told y'all that last week. Oh, my Should I not God. say the name? I don't know. No, I know it was. I mean, it was in the articles I read. I just opted not to. Oh, OK. Well, no, they were great. He never spent the night there. But I was like, Barrett Whoa. was not. <laughs> I don't think anything would have happened had he spent the night there. That I was talking about dog. The the story is the foster dog. So yeah, know. the dog she would foster. Mm, I don't know if she's that sick. She probably, I don't know, did something to dogs who stayed there. Ew. Um, I just couldn't believe it. My Barrett last night was like, wait, what vet? And I was like, oh, I don't know. I didn't even look it up. And I was like, oh, actually, I bet I can. I was like, no. What, what are the odds? Do you remember a uh, like cute little blonde? Girl. Well, that's why I asked Barrett. He, um, we took him in 2020 and it was COVID. So only one of us could go in and it was Barrett. But he was like, there were a ton of girls. Like, I bet I met her. I'm sure I met her. I was like, that's... no way. So I like dug through my emails. I was like, who is our vet? And who prescribed him like the ear medicine that we got? And it was, it was not her. It was someone else. But that's not weird. That's crazy. Ani hated the vet. So he got a vibe. He got a vibe. <laughs> Dogs are very intuitive. <laughs> Every dog hates the vet, but I know I'm kidding. Oh, whoa. I know that it, a, everyone loved that episode, Rach. Good one. Oh, are y'all sure? Thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, the trials in 2024, we're going to go. We're going to cover it. I really want to. It's like um, Conan O'Brien went to John List trial and uh I love that. Me too. I covered John List in episode 12, if you're interested, but uh, mm -hmm. I think I'll touch on it in that episode that uh, Conan O'Brien would leave the city. He was a writer at SNL and he would go take the train in New Jersey to go to that trial because he was into it, which I love it. I know. I love it too. I would love to hear his uh, thoughts on it. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, and I was watching this YouTube where a comment had a really good invention. So... I have to exp I have to tell you all about it. I was watching YouTube about this girl who's dismembered and her body's ultimately found, but they track her last steps and she's in her car going to several ATMs around town. And you can see that she's there's someone in the passenger seat. And then at one point she has to like lean, she's in the passenger seat seat and she has to like lean over this driver who has a mask on and do her ATM. But she's like, it's all on camera. It's very eerie. Mm -mm. And I was reading the comments. And this guy said he has an idea, an ATM idea. Every bank should allow customers to set a panic pin. And if entered, will alert authorities and immediately send the video footage to cops or something. That is a good it's, idea. There, there uh, used to there? be, no, well, there used to be a thing that went around Facebook or being like, did you know that if you put your pen in backwards, it still works and alerts someone? And I'm like, I really don't think that's true. But it mm. always stuck with me. I'm like, would that be something I try? Hell no, because if it says invalid, I'd be so nervous. <laughs> but that's a good idea. A totally new, like primary pen, your real one, you're okay. You're using it, you're getting money out. Yeah. Secondary is, uh-oh. Right. Sends the cops a notification and... They're at this ATM, go, go, go type shit. That would it, be, and I don't know how you would even set that alert up. Can you imagine every single person with a PIN number? Ooh. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But it reminded me of my Alexa idea, which I'm sure is eventually going to be a thing. If y'all don't know, this stemmed from a home invasion in D.C. where the guys kept this family hostage and allowed them to make phone calls, to like call into work and calling sick and tell like the gardener was supposed to come over and there the dad was forced to call him and say never mind we don't need you today and I think there should be a verbal code to Alexa 
if you have an Alexa to the, where you don't have to address her that alerts the police that something's happening. And it can be set to like, please don't hurt me or my family where that just immediately makes Alexa call the police. Yeah. Without addressing her. Like a sentence. Yeah. Yeah. I know it. Inventions. Um, I came across a new podcast recently that I just like want to shout out because it was good. And they kind of remind me of us. <laughs> so so I loved it. It was a great podcast. So they were fantastic. It's called yeah. Tell No One. They're They're not sisters, but they are best friends they seem like they've been friends since the womb you can tell they've like grown up together mm -hmm. um but they're they're funny and they have good stories and i just liked them and i was like oh i feel like we would be friends with these chicks you know oh, okay i'll listen to them tell no one podcast yeah okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. oh before we go on patreon shout out welcome rachel carrie and kimberly hello and welcome Hello, welcome. You've got bonus ups to catch up on. Mm -hmm. All of it. And a shout out to everyone or a request from everyone. We still need more creepy ass stories. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we yeah, yeah. We want to do more of those episodes where we tell your stories back to you, but we need we need some more creepy ones. Um, the last topic of discussion topic I have at the top of the episode was Rachel was talking to our sister, Lauren, yesterday, who suggested we cover the case of Natalie Holloway. Yes. Okay. I'll take it from here. Um, typically, we try to steer clear of like high profile cases that everyone's heard about. But this is unique in which we knew Natalie. We went to high school with Natalie. We may have some fresh perspective um, mm -hmm. Would that be of interest or are you like, it's, it's another really high profile case. We would, it would come from a more personal place. That's why yeah. I'm like, it could be cool. I would like to hear stuff yeah. like that. Um, but let us know what you think. Right. And if you don't want to hear it, don't be afraid to tell us our feelings won't be hurt. Yeah. Y'all uh, No, there's no right answer. Yep. There are only wrong answers. <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> Right. <laughs> just, just I'm backing y'all into a corner here. That's what I meant. I meant there are no wrong <laughs> answers. Only right answers. My bad. <laughs> the second I said it, I was like, right? <laughs> that doesn't seem right. Seems mean. Seems a little pushy, but <laughs> uh, oh, sorry, I'm tired. Oh my God, me too. And this is let's get into it. God, I've got to go on a run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm forcing myself to run today. That's it. Forget it. All right. Today, I'm telling you about Lauren Giddings. Shout out to Macon, Georgia listeners. This is one's a hometown for y'all. I hope I do it justice. For real. It's mm -hmm. a big one. Sources are Macon Telegraph, subscriber edition. Thanks to my sister, Tarver. This story is heavily Macon Telegraph. They have 248 articles on this case. They did a great job covering it. There's also a dateline on it. Um, WGXA and True Crime Garage did a two-parter on this, mainly about the killer. And I've watched endless YouTube police footage. Lauren Giddings was born on April, April 18th, 1984 in Tacoma Park, Maryland. That's between D.C. and Baltimore. I took my insurance exam there. Failed. No biggie. Oh, you did fail? I don't yeah. remember that. Oh, okay. my God. Yeah. But she always saw herself living in the South, so she went to Agnes Scott in Atlanta for undergrad, then at 24 years old, moved to Macon, Georgia in 2008 to attend law school at Mercer University. Our sister Tarber lives in Macon, if that wasn't. <clears throat> oh, yeah. There. she want, Yeah, so this is where we heard about this case. Yeah. She wanted to be a public defender, and not only is Mercer a really good law school, but it's where Nancy Grace went, who Lauren loved. I mean, and who doesn't? Who doesn't know? <laughs> a, lot, a lot of people don't like her. A but. lot of people. <laughs> I was going to say, who doesn't know that NG went to Mercer? Everyone knows that. It's Surely knowledge. they do. Surely they do. I know a lot of people don't like her, but let's face it. We all want that bitch on our side if we go missing. Listen, she's not going to let any Tom, Dick, or Harry walk away, get, getting away with some murder of a girl. That's no, what I'm saying. That No, she's not. Especially a fellow Mercer grad. Could you imagine? That's right. 
She really took to making two. According to her friends, she packed up all her pink and seersucker outfits, took her dog Butterbean, and never looked back. She's literally Elle Woods of Mercer University. Oh my God, that's so funny. Watch out, Lily Pulitzer stores. Yeah. <laughs> Lauren's coming in hot. Coming in hot. Cute. She immediately, <laughs> she immediately became involved in the community, her church, and was eventually the president of the Federalist Society. She interned at a law firm in Atlanta one summer, and that's where she met her boyfriend, David Vandiver. Vandiver? He was 20 years older than her, but they were pretty serious at first until reality set in and being in different cities and different stages of life, life kind of caught up to them and things became a little rocky. She started seeing another guy named Joe who also went to Mercer, but David was always on her mind. He became like that guy to her. Yeah. You know the one. We all have that guy in the younger years. You're probably not with him right now because I really don't. <laughs> I don't. You don't? I no. guess not. Yeah, I guess not. Blake. <laughs> no. Rose. <laughs> I wanna I wanna ditch the Blake. Why? Because I feel like you talk about him every damn episode. I mean, maybe, maybe that's your guy. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, you, totally. You're welcome to him. You're obsessed. Mm, I am. So May 2011 was graduation, and Lauren and all her friends were planning to hunker down and study for the bar at the end of June. So they were living it up until then, and they deemed one Friday night as their last hoorah, and everyone went out big. They closed down the bar and late nighted at her friend's boyfriend's apartment, who happened to be roommates with ex-boyfriend Joe. Uh-huh. So she late nighted at Joe's, essentially. Yeah. Eventually, everyone passed out, including Lauren, and they all woke up hung hungover as shit and parted ways to lounge at their own apartments. Ah, uh, lazy Sunday. Love a lazy, well, lazy Saturday. Oh, right. Lauren lived in a small complex on Georgia Avenue, and there are 16 apartments, so like uber small, and they're all for law students. Their website says it's a law student community. It's the closest apartment building to Mercer. St students get a discount in the summer and complimentary Wi-Fi, so very catered to students. Yeah, that's nice. Mm -hmm. No one saw her the rest of the weekend, but honestly, it wasn't that weird since they were all preparing to buckle down and study. She even told her family and may have even made it her Facebook status that she was going to be off the radar for a while. Okay. But the following Tuesday, Lauren's friend in Maryland, Katie, texted some pictures from a wedding they had from weeks prior, and Lauren never responded. This wouldn't typically be weird, but apparently they were not cute photos <laughs> and would warrant a response at least to say, like, do not post these something. Oh my God, that is so funny. My <laughs> first thought was if they were really good pictures, to be like, damn, I look good. No, they're quite the opposite, apparently. Oh, that's fun. That's really funny. Yeah. So the next day, Katie texted again and again, no answer. So she called Lauren's sister, who Facebook messaged Ashley Morehouse, one of Lauren's law school friends. Mm -hmm. By this time, it was Wednesday, and she hadn't seen Lauren since that Friday night. So she drives over there, knocks on the door, but no answer. Lauren is a big runner, so Ashley assumes she's out running and leaves. But that night, her sister calls Ashley back and is like, no, seriously, get in that apartment. She's still not answering. Oh, God. So around midnight, Ashley goes back over there with her boyfriend this time because that is the scariest task in the world. And they use a spare key to get in. Lauren wasn't in there, but her keys, purse, and phone were. And she was actually supposed to move out the next day. She was moving to Atlanta to be with David. And none of her boxes were packed, but all her clothes were out, folded, and looked like they were ready to be packed. The next day, Ashley rounded up all their friends, including neighbors, and they all started looking around the law school, the apartment building. They found in her car a Zaxby's receipt, time stamped at 6 p.m. that Saturday. And they re-entered her apartment, and nothing seems to be amiss. Lauren's sister knew her email password, so she gives it to Ashley. And they see a very eerie email sent to David at 10, 13 p.m. on Saturday telling him that she thinks someone's trying to break in. Ugh. This is why I have your passwords, too. Oh, I know. Same. And this was actually not the first time she's mentioned someone breaking in. That Friday night, she told her friends she felt like she was being watched by someone. They didn't take it too seriously. I'm sure they were a little tipsy and they were probably like, totally, yeah, everyone's obsessed with you. But we later found out she also mentioned to her sister that sometimes when she comes home, she knows someone's been in there because things are moved around. 
No, uh -uh. that's a pass. That is a lease breaking situation. Unless you're being funny about it. Remember in Oxford when Anna and Eden's neighbors used to come over and would put their pictures. <laughs> they would bring over like, like their decor and like put it on their <laughs> no. tables. No, I don't remember so that. They'd That's walk hilarious. in and like, it'd be pictures of Kristoff and wh whoever his roommate was. And they'd be like, why is this here? <laughs> they'd be like, no. They would, they would set it up like it was their apartment. Oh, that, that's funny. This is not. I think, God, maybe I'm inventing that. I'm certain that happened once at least. That sounds about right. That's hilarious. So after they see this email to David, Lauren's sister calls their uncle, who is a cop in D.C., and he says, hold the fucking phone. Tell her friends to get out of the apartment, get out of her car. Don't touch a damn thing. Call 911. He tells I mean, them to go. Go, go. But at this point, it's been, what, almost a week. I know, it's like four days. Oh, my God. Yeah. Forget calling the friends. By that point, just go straight to the police. It's been way past 24 hours since anyone's talked to her. I know. Oof. They do call the cops, and oddly enough, cops happen to come on trash day, and they happen to park right in front of the curbside trash cans blocking the garbage man who pulled up a few minutes, few minutes after the police did. Ooh. The garbage man waved to the cops to say, like, don't worry about it, we'll swing back by for the trash, and continued on their route. And thank God they did, Rach, because while detectives were outside, they got a whiff of an awful smell. They followed the smell to the trash cans and started digging through each one of them. And at the bottom of one, they found a large item wrapped in a bunch of plastic. It was the torso of a woman wearing nothing but pink athletic shorts. Oh, Horrifying. my God. Mm. Oh, God. Had the garbage man been able to empty that bin, Lauren would still be considered a missing person. This case would never be solved, and I'll get to why that is. So chill. Cops did not want neighbors or anyone to know what they found, so they took every tenant downtown to the police station to get the recorded statements while crime scene techs did their thing at the building. They used trusty old luminol in her bathroom, and it lights up floor to ceiling. The bathtub oh. literally glowed from the bottom of the tub to two inches from the top of the tub. Zero oh white God. space. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. It's like her body was drained in that tub. Whoa. Yeah. Oh. But there was not one fingerprint aside from Lauren's in the entire apartment. It's fucking weird. They made the call to Lauren's dad, who was already on the 11-hour drive from Maryland, and they tell him that a body's been found, and when he gets into town, he demands to see it. No. He wants to be the one to identify his daughter, and they told him absolutely not. They were doing a rush test, and they would have the identity in a few hours. Mr. Giddings is insistent, and the chief of police clears the room and told him he wasn't talking to him as a chief to father. It was father to father, and that is not the last way you want to remember your daughter. Oh. Um, well, no. Oh, so her head was, they found her head. No. Nope. Then what no. was he trying to identify her on? Just I don't think torso? he knew that. Yeah, he said we found a body. I don't think he knew that uh, how dismembered the body was. Yeah. Obviously, they're questioning David and Joe, thinking maybe this was some sort of jealous love triangle. And Joe did confirm that that Friday night, Lauren slept in his bed, but she left early and said that she was going to the country club to relax by the pool. They looked at her account activity and that checked out. She did make some purchases there. And they also checked the cameras at that Zaxby's where her friends found their seat from. And she's seen pulling up, but it's hard to see if anyone's in the car with her. And they know she was alive at 10, 13 p.m. Saturday night because that's when she sent that email to David saying that she has the feeling that someone's breaking in. Sad note, the guys on True Crime Garage do not think she sent this email. Oh, interesting. It's, it's an interesting theory, but I, I believe she sent it. It'd be too well, much of a coincidence. She's already told her sister that she thinks people break in. I don't know. And why would the murderer send that? I know it doesn't steer away from anything or anyone. But on the other hand, it, it's hard to believe that an email is the first thing you would do. Yeah, I know it is, but he was in California on a golf trip. So maybe, I don't know. Maybe that's just how they communicated. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, there's text messaging. I, I don't know. know. Okay. It is. Yeah. So I could say I, I could be convinced either way, but it doesn't seem like it would help the murderer to do that. Right. 
So they bring David in thinking maybe he found out about Joe and Lauren hooking up and got jealous. But again, he was in Cal in California on a golf trip. He gave them receipts. His friends vouched for, it, vouched for him. He's clear pretty early on. Everyone was released from questioning. And when Lauren's neighbors get back to the apartment, local news has swarmed it. Word had gotten out about the body, but the tenants still didn't know. So a local news station is interviewing Lauren's direct next door neighbor, Stephen McDaniel, and accidentally tells him a body has been found. And here's a clip. I'm going to play the clip. Yeah, Lauren was my neighbor. Um, we're just trying to find out where she is at this point. I mean, no one had seen her since Saturday. I mean, the last time anyone heard from her was an email that she sent out, and no one's heard from her since. Did you see her hang out with anyone at the time and giving back? I, no, no, no one has seen her since Saturday. I haven't seen anything. I mean, we always hear noise outside, but it's just people walking by pretty much. He's, uh, she just recently graduated the first day? Yeah, she and I were, we were both JD students. Um, we graduated back in May. What kind of person was she? I mean, how did you, what did you do? I mean, she's as nice as can be. I mean, very personable, very much people person. Do you know anybody that, any enemies you might have had, somebody that might want to hurt her? No, I mean, we're, we don't know where she is. I mean, the only thing we can think is that maybe she went out running and someone snatched her. Because, I mean, we went, at, we went over, one of her friends had a key. We went inside and tried to see if there was anything we missed. But, I mean, she had a door jam that was sitting right by it. So there was no sign that anyone broke in. I mean, the was locked when everyone got here. I mean, we, we just don't know where she is. I mean, what about um in the, like, the parking lot area? I know they've been doing a lot of, I think that's where they have recovered the body or whatever they recovered from there. Body. Had you heard, had you seen anything there? Had you seen anything there? I mean, we don't know if this is the same person. You know what I mean? Like, they took out a body there earlier. We don't know if it's the same person. Else. That's how we're trying to ask people if they know who lived there. Are you okay, sir? I think I need to sit down. Okay. Yikes. What you just heard was the reaction of a murderer realizing he's about to get caught. Yep. Live oh. on air. Live ass TV. Let me paint the picture for you. He does not look like your typical law student. He has this big ass curly hair. He's pasty. He's skinny. He looks more like he stepped out of the set of Days Confused than a law student classroom yeah so in total this interview is 12 minutes after his performance he takes a 20 minute break and he comes back to answer more questions i'll play this for y'all too oh lord what's oh. going on in your mind right now like what are you thinking why would anyone do this god <laughs> hear anything no. I, I something. Maybe I gotta help him. Okay, don't worry. You wanna sit down for a second? You have something to drink? You know, a bunch of her friends are getting together. Or... We, went, we went over to law school to see if maybe she was uh, over in the, the library studying or something. And we, we looked up in the study rooms on the third floor, and there was, there was no one there. Then we came back, we looked around, and tried to find any anything to figure out where she was. And if she had, I could have done something. I, I could have lent her a handgun. I've, I've got a little handgun that I have for defense. And Yeah, I mean, something. I mean, if she was afraid in her apartment, then, I mean, Get her out of there. All right. The wimpy ass bitch. I don't understand the need to put yourself in the middle of it. That poor reporter's like, okay, well, do you want to sit down? Do you want to yeah. do you want to maybe take a minute? A few notes that I've noticed during this bullshit interview. He keeps saying we, like putting himself in her friend group. They yeah. were not friends. He was the creepy neighbor who occasionally talked to her, but by no means were they friends. Yeah. The fake crying, and then he quickly pulls it together and say, no, we went to the law school, we looked for her and studying and blah, 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 blah. And 
what always gets me is he offers his theory as to what happened, what he thinks happened, which initially I'm like, sure, a lot of people think she went running and got kidnapped. But no one said it on live TV when an investigation is underway. Yeah. And I was really thinking about it. I don't, I would never think about if your neighbor was missing, the cops are already on the case and you offer up to the media that you think someone kidnapped her while she was running with absolutely nothing to back it up. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't want to start rumors, F with an investigation or say anything to potentially steer the investigation. Like, I just, I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. Yeah. I would privately to the cops. Yeah. To the cops, I'll say anything. But only to the media. Yeah, you're right. Oh, God. So all the neighbors allowed cops to look into their apartment and do a quick walkthrough, Stephen included, but he took a while to oblige. He wasn't going to let them at first, which, fine, you're a law student who probably mm -hmm. wants to do it the right way, have an attorney present, whatever. But yeah. why now? You already provided cops a recorded interview without an attorney. You're flapping your gums on local news stations without an attorney. He made it very clear to police he wanted to do anything to help him. He was leading search parties. And now all of a sudden you're a little you're a little hesitant about your level of involvement with this walkthrough. Yeah. And, and like, you didn't see this coming. She was found on the uh, the apartment complex grounds dismembered and there's only 16 apartments. Right. Like, you, you didn't see this coming? And they, without a warrant, they're not doing anything. They're not digging around. They're not pulling up floorboards. They essentially want to check to see if those, there's a body there and leave. So yeah. initially he says no. And so they tell him literally every other neighbor has let them do this. So he changes his tune. Now, in the apartment, they find two condoms on the table. During his first conversation with police down at the station, he told them he was a virgin, which they're like, no, we know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that checks out. <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> so they ask him why he has them, and he says he broke into two neighbors' apartments and stole them. I just feel like there's so many other things to say to cover it up, but I appreciate your honesty. There's also, condoms aren't illegal. You could just <laughs> march your ass to any old drugstore, any gas station. Get your own damn condoms. What's your problem? <laughs> I don't know. They also see he has guns, but he told him he's never shot a gun before, which like I get for protection, as he said in that news interview. But why three? They also found a woman's T-shirt and underwear cut in the shape of a mask. Cut Wait. in the shape of a mask. Women's underwear. He turned into a mask. Wait, I, I tried the very hard to find details on this, on how he cut it into a mask. Like a like. I'm guessing medical mask, a COVID mask. I'm guessing. Okay. Gross. Disgusting. Ew. So they're getting a vibe. <laughs> I know. It's just so fucking weird. Oh my God. I need a minute on that mm -hmm. one. They also found a styrofoam cup with the name Lauren written on it, which <clears throat> they have no idea how it's related or anything. But in my mind, I feel like I do. Oh, what? I don't He is really disgusting. But why else would you have a girl, a cup? What would you put in a cup with a girl's name in it? Oh, uh, to <laughs> masturbate into? Yeah, that's what I think it is. That's not, I, I didn't do? read one report on it. Why? Oh, it's just weird. And you'll, oh, by the end of the story, that will make sense. Is it his handwriting? Yeah. It's just oh. so weird. Like, why do you have that? And I'm that's like, why would you end up? No one and every article I read, they're like, it's on. We have no idea why. But I'm like, oh, I feel like I know why. Blech. Well, it's weird that it's his handwriting because in my mind, I'm like, okay, maybe he somehow got into her apartment. She had that cup. I don't, people like write their name on yeah. solo cups, styrofoam cups. He had a drink out of it or something. And then on his way out after murdering her, he was like, shit, my DNA is going to be on that. I'll throw that away later. And just didn't. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. But his, but his handwriting writing Lauren is weird as shit. I, I don't think know. it was his handwriting. I think that's what it said. I don't know. So they get a weird vibe and they actually arrest him on burglary for those two condoms. <laughs> yes. <laughs> While well, they got, I don't know. Why would you say that? It's so it, weird. Like the school was passing them out. Anything, any old thing, anything would do. I bought them my damn self. Yeah, like, you can buy individuals, right? 
breaking in. So well, stupid. Not even individuals. They, there could have been two left in a pack that he bought. But he's a virgin. How would you explain that? I thought I might lose it this weekend. <laughs> I was getting excited. Right. So they arrest him while they gathered some evidence uh, around the complex and they get a search warrant into his apartment. And his second interview is creepy as shit. I'm sorry. He's doing more interviews? <laughs> With the police, the interrogation. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm so like anyway, picturing... He gets back on the news. I'm picturing every news station in town being like, oh, will you talk to us? And yeah, he's like, sure. Us. Come over. No, he is in the interrogation room. He is a robot. He is what you would think Michael Myers would be like if he talked at all. He's moving really slowly, giving one word answers, very monotone, very weird demeanor. At the beginning, the detective demands Stephen look at him and he turns his head really slowly. And I can only imagine the evil gaze he saw up close because it seems to unnerve the detective after a while. He's like, never mind, look away. Yeah. He like shifts his body language and backs away a little bit as if he's Oof. like really weirding him out. It's, he even asks Stephen if something's happened or if he remembers talking to him earlier that day and he reintroduces himself. He's like, what is wrong with you? Oh, shit. Eventually, he brings in someone else because this shit goes on for two hours. So let me play a little clip so you hear what I'm talking about, how he's responding. Pretty girl right there? Yes. You're telling me you looked at a pretty girl like that and you never once thought ever? Man, she looks good. You never thought that? I don't understand. What do you mean you don't understand? Did, you know how when you're sitting there and you see a girl walking down the road? And you say, man, that girl looks good. You ever take a look at a girl and you think to yourself, man, that girl looks good? Yes. You never thought that about her? Yes. So you mean to tell me you look at porn on the internet and get off to that, but you never looked at her and said, man, I wonder what it'd be like to have sex with her? Yes. You have? No. Jeez. And the entire time it's like this. And if you can't hear it, it's because he's talking so damn lightly. Softly. I heard it. Oh, you did? Mm -hmm. But a recap in case, I don't know. Just a yeah, yeah. recap in case you can't hear it. The detective says, see that pretty girl? Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> you tell me you look at a pretty girl like that and you never thought, man, she looks good. I don't understand. <laughs> what do you mean? You you know when you see a girl walking down the road and you think, damn, that girl looks good. Yes. You never thought about that? You never thought about that with Lauren? Yes. So you look at porn and get off, you get off to that, but you look at Lauren and never thought, man, I wonder what it would be like to have sex with her. Yes. You have? No. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's insane. And they switch back and forth between good cop, bad cop. And they eventually call him a little shit who ran his fucking mouth to the fucking news. But now he's being a little pussy. It's like, it's, I love oh, the yeah. accents. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But his demeanor doesn't change. They ask why he has guns if he doesn't shoot. To have. Oh like, say God. anything. So you just told the news is for your protection. Like, say, it, say it's because I wanted to learn how to shoot. Anything will do. Oh, or... Maybe say, I'd like to exercise my right to an attorney and stop this interview. <laughs> right. Like, what are you doing? It's now it's the time to lawyer up, bud. Bizarre. It's very bizarre. Yeah, and he just graduated law school. I'm like, you just, now's the time. Request your attorney. That's or, it. Or just don't say anything. Right. But these one word creepy answers are like really infuriating the police. Yeah. Further searching the apartment complex, they find a lot of damning stuff. In the storage room, they find a hacksaw with skin and blood on it. Oh, my God. Oh, God. Oh. And a bloody sheet in the washing machine. Oh, and their washing machine is all apartments in, so they don't, each individual unit doesn't have its own washing dry, washer yeah. dryer. They have, like, a laundry room. Yeah. Got it. The storage room is only accessible by the maintenance man who already gave them a rock solid alibi. 
They search Stephen's apartment again, and this time start digging around. They find the packaging to that hacksaw. They find two keys, which were quickly tested. One was a copy of the storage room, and the other went to Lauren's apartment. They found a wad of hair, later tested to be Lauren's. They also take USB drives, laptops, digital cameras, everything you'd expect them to. They charge Stephen with murder, but they knew defense, the defense attorney could raise reasonable doubt. Like they hadn't found, found her entire body, so they didn't have a cause of death. None of Stephen's DNA was in Lauren's apartment. The underwear in his apartment was tested. It was, in fact, Lauren's, but that's not necessarily murder, just repulsive as shit. And the hacksaw wasn't found in his apartment. So it could be argued that it was stolen from him. Uh, what do you I mean know. it could be stolen from him? It was like in the someone store. could have stolen the hacksaw from his apartment, killed her, and put it in the storage room. The uh, uh, storage uh, yeah. room was where the hacksaw was. The packaging yeah. was in his apartment. He says, yeah, I bought it. I didn't use it. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That could easily be argued. Yeah. Which is what I think um, Brian Koberger's argument's going to be, but whatever. Oh, that someone stole his knife? Mm-hmm. But his DNA was on the sheath. The issue isn't yeah, that it's he... Yeah, it's his knife. It's his sheath. But his, his fingerprints his... were real. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's just, an, uh, it's just an option. I don't know. So who are Steve... you to try to defend Brian Koberger? <laughs> well, I'm not. Listen. You're getting, you giving them advice? No. No, I'm not. Just kidding. So initially, Stephen is pleading not guilty. And prosecution needs more. So they turn to the GBI to execute good old fashioned internet search history and digital camera search. And holy shit. Hold on to your hat. Okay. First, the computer showed he looked up. I hate that this has been a theme in our episodes, but he looked up child pornography. And the analyst who does this for a living said it was the most violent child pornography he had ever seen. No. Yes. They obviously add this to his charges. He looked up dismemberment, molesting a sleeping girl, choked until unconscious. How long do they wake up? Nude Lauren Giddings. I guess they were, he was hoping for a scorned ex-boyfriend or something. Oh, my God. He also spent hours Googling her name, looking at her social media, LinkedIn, and even her Amazon wish list. Whoa. Um, he Googled necrophilia and gynephagia which is a specific type of cannibalism that involves cooking and eating women specifically. Oh my God. The USBs from his room showed hundreds of pictures of Lauren. Some were taken from her Facebook, but a lot of them were taken from her computer that she had never posted. So he clearly broke into her apartment and exported them from her laptop. So this dude's fucked up. They also tell from timestamps of his searches that he would look at the violent porn and then go back to pictures of Lauren. Look at the violent porn, pictures of Lauren. So you go Gross. switch back and forth. Now the digital camera. They find a video of himself spying on Lauren through her window the night she's murdered. It Ooh. is so chilling. That is so gross. So they're both on the ground floor? No, they're on the second level. Oh. Did he get to her patio? Yeah, they're, well, the front doors are like... Picture of the apartment complex. It's a two-story apartment complex. The doors are all lead out to the outside. Yeah. And the second floor is all one big patio. So oh. all their doors are next to each other. But he does, and he does tape a camera to a six-foot pole and goes underneath to get her window, to her bedroom window. It's, too, it, it's a little too confusing to say, so let's just leave it at, they're on the no, second. The, yeah, they're on the second floor, and there's a one big outdoor hallway. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. That is sick. The clip released to the public doesn't show her. Thank God. It's mainly her empty bedroom and his nasty ass grunty breath. Ew. Which is so creepy. But she knew it. She felt like someone had been watching her. Someone had been in her apartment when she wasn't there. And she was right. This guy is obsessed with her. Then they find a message board he posted where he calls himself Son of Liberty. And here is what he said. This was read by District, District Attorney Greg Winters. Party hard by drinking alone in front of my computer. See my sexy neighbor and classmate come home late. 
just talked to me occasionally in the past, has wanted a certain piece of my anatomy for three years. Invite her up for a nightcap. Make her a special drink called Mickey Finn. She's out cold. I finally lose my V card. Oh no, she OD'd and died. I barbecue her legs and arms to celebrate losing my V card. Not into organ meat, but throw the torso out. Lose it on TV while the cops are discovering her remains. You mad virgins. What? Uh-huh. Who? According to Macon Telegraph, by the time they were finished reading this, Stephen's head was down and his eyes were closed on the defense table. Oh, God. His roommate from college came forward and said Stephen always talked about how he could get away with the perfect murder. And, um, and that he would love to have someone's life in his hands, hear them beg for it, then take it. He told him he buys shoes that are too small just in case he decides to act on this desire and leaves footprints. Uh, oh, my God. I know. He took a theater class in college to see how convincing he would be if ever needed to lie. So he's oh. been wanting to do this for a very long time. It didn't work. Right. That, that theater class. No, it sure didn't. Oh, that roommate. <laughs> that you poor son imagine? of a bitch. He's like, I've been thinking about it. I'm not going <laughs> to renew my lease. Thank you so much. This has been a great this year. This has been so fun. Best of luck to you. And all your endeavors, you psychopath. So they had more than enough to convict him. And this would be considered capital punishment. And the state of Georgia will happily kill you. Not a but, problem. Not a problem there. But Stephen's defense attorney happened to be one of Lauren's teachers and knew that Lauren was against the death penalty. Um, is that not a conflict of interest? Not if the not if his client says it's okay and Stephen says it's okay. Interesting, oh, though. Interesting. Lauren's mother was also against the death penalty, and dis the district attorney said, quote, the woman who gave birth to the victim has the biggest sway on me. So he, took, I don't know. so he took the death penalty off the table. April 2014, with everything stacked against him, he changed his plea to guilty and confessed to everything. Here's what happened. At 4.30 a.m. that Sunday morning, he snuck into her apartment wearing gloves and a mask and watched her sleep for a while. Ooh. When he stepped forward to approach her, the floor creaked and she sat up in bed. And in his written confession, he then says, she calmly told me to get the fuck out, which I imagine was a trembling, petrified voice mistaken for being calm. Yeah. I leaped across the bed onto her and grabbed her around the throat. We tumbled out of bed to the floor and in her struggle to get away, she moved her legs and lower body under the bed, preventing her from getting away or kicking me. Oh, no. I uh, know. That just gives me like the biggest, oh, what was going through her mind when her legs were stuck under that bed? Yeah. Mm. She's like, shit. Right. <sighs> and as she continues to fight, she pulls off his mask and her last words were, Stephen, please stop. Oh, no. Oh, no. Once she stopped moving, he dragged her body to the bathtub and called it a night. He just went to bed. The next day, he said he spent most of, his, most of his day on his computer and then went back to Lauren's apartment later that night to dismember her. I removed her limbs and her head. I wrapped them in several black trash bags separately and discarded them in the Mercer Law School dumpster. Her head and limbs have never been found. Oh. And had it not been for the cops blocking the trash can, her torso never would have been found either. They weren't able to, de to detect any sexual assault and he denied ever performing any sexual acts on her, which I find very hard to believe. Ah, uh, yeah. But he said that's why they found the pink shorts on her, because he never removed them even when dismembering her. Bullshit. He was sentenced to life in prison. He'll be up for parole in 2041. But Rach, did you know, uh, in 2018, he appealed his conviction, claiming his rights were violated or some shit, and blamed his counsel, who, by the way, were the two best defense attorneys in Macon. But whatever. Oh, sure. He represented himself. So this is good. Oh, yeah. Hey, love I love that. it. I love it. He's like, I went, to, I went to law school a decade ago. I got this. Reminds me of jury duty when he says. 
<laughs> okay, I'll, I'll finish the sentence for her because I know what she's going to say. In jury duty, the defendant decides to defend himself. <laughs> so, so he stands at the podium, asks a question, and then runs to the stand to answer it. So I'm like, what's your name? And he runs, answers, and then he runs back, asks the next question. Where, is, where are you from? He runs back. <laughs> and then she I cannot stress this enough. Stop what you're doing right now and go watch it. I'm going to rewatch it. I'm rewatching it. I, I want to too. All right. So, oh, and you'll need a palate cleanser after the story. So y'all just go watch jury duty. Oh, please. So he questions his, his defense attorney, Floyd Buford, and asks if he recalled anything about their first interaction and McDaniel's demeanor. And Floyd just goes, yeah, weird. Oh, yeah, you're weird as shit. Why? What? Yeah. He asked why they steered him to plead guilty. And the judge even warned Stephen to tread lightly about his inquiries because he was essentially asking Buford to break attorney client privilege. But Stephen just kept on keeping on and Buford's gloves came off. And he reminded Stephen he was just a law student at that time who didn't know what he was doing. And they called the shots on his behalf. He said he genuinely thought Stephen was innocent until that video of Lauren's apartment came out and Stephen ran to him crying and confessed everything. He said Stephen told him in great detail about he, how he decapitated her and how he cut off her fingers one by one and flushed them down the toilet. Whoa. This was left out of the confession in 2014, obviously. Oh. Oh. The judge ultimately denied his appeal, and since then, he's attempted several times to get his conviction overturned, the latest being December 2022, and it's been oh. denied every time. Good. Like, shut up. Take your life sentence like a man. Stop wasting everyone's time. Up for parole in 2041 is upsetting. Oh, he will never see the light of day. Okay, good. No, everyone's confident he's, that he's spending the rest of his life in prison. Oh, he's where he should be. And that, Rach, is who is the worst this week. <laughs> he is the worst this week. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. You are the best. People are the worst. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye.